then try and like configurate the car. The issue is, imagine you had all the different parts of a car and a motor and everything laid in front of you, but you've never seen a car before, so you don't under you don't know what it's supposed to do. Even you don't even know that it's supposed to transport people. It's kind of very hard to sometimes understand what a system is supposed to do by just looking at its parts. Hello everyone, welcome to the Experience Podcast. My name is Tejaswa or Tex, and together you and I are going to have amazing conversations with amazing people and learn so much through our experiences. This is a listener-supported podcast, so any level of Patreon subscription or one-time donation will be accepted with a lot of gratitude and used back to making this podcast experience even greater. In today's episode, I can't wait to welcome Ruben. We're going to be talking about the science of complexity and how it may be used to understand ourselves more. But first, let's take a deep breath and close our eyes and reflect on the word complexity. Maybe it's a feeling, a memory, a person, an environment, or whatever else may come to mind. Whenever you're ready, you may open your eyes. Keep this thought in mind, maybe write it down on a piece of paper, because we will come back to it later in the episode. If you're comfortable, we'd love to know what you thought of, so please do share with us in the comments below, or feel free to message us. Let's begin. So welcome back to the Experience Podcast, everyone. In this episode, we have with us Ruben. Ruben is a very, very dear friend of mine, almost like a brother to me. We've we used to live together for four years in London while we were both at Imperial. He still is at Imperial. Um, and he studied biochemistry uh, with a year in management and is now going to study health data and analytics. Yeah. yeah. Cool, Ruben. So what's up? What have you been up to? <laughs> well, thank you for that intro. Um, not much, to be honest. I mean, I'm currently still having my summer break, which has mm -hmm. been very nice and very um kind of relaxing kind of coming down from the height of the management year and <laughs> blending into a certain kind of um archetype of personality that i don't necessarily succumb to mm. um but it's it's been fun it's it's been an interesting year for sure i've learned a lot yeah um and yeah currently there's not much going on i'm working with college at the moment i'm um creating a new community forum for them where hopefully by 2022 we will be able as imperial students to discuss social cultural <laughs> topics yeah which, which is something that uh tex knows a lot about because <laughs> he talks about this a lot um essentially yeah. we identified the need for kind of an inclusive platform where we can talk yeah. about topics like um, privilege, microaggressions, um, unconscious bias, and mm. stuff like that. Like just stuff that, as a technology college, I think we often don't kind of talk about because we think it's they're very inherently political topics and they're social topics, and they do govern our organizational culture. And I do want to create an awareness for that. And I yeah. think a lot of it is about um, kind of actually encouraging participation of, of different individuals at Imperial and kind of uh, giving a platform to underrepresented voices, which is fun to work. Yeah, with. no, I mean, I can't imagine that's really, really interesting and very important. I feel like, you know, you and I both agree on this, even just having that feeling of community is something that yeah. at least I did not get exactly. at, at, in, in my uni life. I mean, I don't think there was any conscious effort from from most people to even try and create that because how does one even start you know yeah i think um, apartments yeah. often have that fault right like we often think oh we're going to a community college or like like have this college community within our departments but when it comes down to it a lot of students are there to 
do their work and like go to labs and like do their their coursework but they're not really there to engage with with yeah. the community that they have and even if they do it's often governed by a lot of um kind of very superficial fault lines kind of like surface face like surface level differences that kind of make you shift into groups just based on your nationality or yeah. based on your interests within clubs and societies which is fun and it's great at yeah. least we have those pockets but they kind of become a little bit of an echo chamber and like i think it's not really the community that we were looking forward when we were going to imperial <laughs> definitely i think i think we get so caught up in our own you know as you say projects and deadlines and exams and you and i have seen this with with, with ourselves as well you know uh that that we forget to consciously make an effort to i don't know take that step forward but i'm very very happy that you know people like you are on it and i mean i'm just hoping to shift the paradigm a little bit we'll see whether it can actually do something i'm just hoping to kind of start a conversation and give people exactly that feeling of community yeah and you know even if it takes years and years i think at least you've planted that seed and that seed will take some time to grow yeah. but it needs to be nourished it needs to be loved and yeah. you know hopefully the people who take over this project after you after you graduate next year yeah um, hopefully will be will be there so you talked about that you said this word echo chamber do you want to elaborate a little bit about what that means so obviously echo chamber is kind of this um this idea that that often communities especially of marginalized communities or underrepresented voices often there is actually a pool of information there mm. that kind of could be tapped into but because they're isolated they're kind of excluded or they they live in their own little pocket be it a cultural society or be a kind of just like an interest group or stuff um these regards are not really fed into the information system of the system at large taking imperial college the concerns of of certain groups weren't really taken into the academic stream as well like mm -hmm. for example if you have um let's take let's take an example like if you have like a like a cultural society um they know about their struggles at imperial and they know what they would like to be changed but it's very hard for them to tap into that in an academic sense because mm. they're seen as a group within the union they're they're a social group so it's very hard for them to kind of like advocate for themselves within like their academic departments and stuff and the town halls are really just there to kind of facilitate that and kind of break open that information chain mm -hmm. and make us actually take advantage of our diversity that we have because we have people from hundreds of, of different countries at imperial yeah we really do i think that's that's definitely one of the things which i found very fascinating which maybe we don't see a lot in other places but london and especially imperial there were so many diverse people and you said and i was actually having a conversation about diversity with somebody else um, on another episode tatiana yeah um, and she was also talking about how diversity is so important because it gives you a different perspective and when we're trying to solve problems we need that different perspective yeah and there's this quote that i really like and it says i think it was by albert einstein i'm not sure you can't solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it and i think that's really really cool and so if you know we created a problem and we're the same ones trying to solve it of course it's nice but having a different perspective on the same problem is so rich you know um so exactly. definitely yeah yeah I, I totally agree with that and i think we have as you say we have this pool of diversity it's really about harnessing it yeah and i think what people often forget is that inclusion isn't kind of just the word that's in the room like it it very much matters what culture you're exposed to you know like it it's not just enough to admit a diverse range of people into a project or into college or or even into um a company it's really what kind of culture you give them and like what culture you set up mm -hmm. for them to thrive and work in so what we've said now with the town halls is we want to shift the culture at imperial which right now is very much a culture of assimilation so people from underrepresented student groups often feel this kind of pressure to assimilate to the status quo like the mm. the perfect like guy who goes to the library every day like who's probably from a british background who has a very good understanding of the english language um and does things very strongly the way that the departments intended to 
Mm. Um, we kind of want to shift that culture from assimilation to accommodation, kind of creating a culture at Imperial, hopefully that can accommodate differences and it can accommodate and, and make people foster their own academic and identities, which is wow. really important. No, that's really, really nice because I remember having conversations with people and, you know, yes, we're doing, at least in my case, yes, we're doing engineer and engineering and stuff, but I never felt like the ideal engineering student ever, so. uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's crazy because, you know, people from outside Imperial sometimes talk to me and they're like, wow, you're doing so many cool things, you know, not not just at Imperial, but also like they look at my CAD tutorials and stuff yeah. that I do online. They're like, oh, you're doing so much, but you know, um, you're like such a great student. And I'm like, I don't know about that, you know? We've um, talked about this so many <laughs> times. And then uh, I think I think our conclusion of, of the conversation we had was with, with you and with the other people that I had this conversation with is there is no ideal student. You know, we have the stereotypical image of an ideal student, you know, as you said, especially in an imperial stereotypical way, you know, right after lectures, you're, you're going to the library, you're, you know, making your notes, doing your tutorial sheets and everything, doing everything on time. It just never happened. Yeah. Just never. And so every time it was different from that stereotypical line, I felt, oh, no, I'm a terrible student and I've learned nothing at all. Yeah, but actually, it's... it's far from the truth, isn't it? It's, exactly. it's crazy. Yeah. But you feel this imposter syndrome almost, don't you? Like, it's, yeah. it's this crazy, like, kind of pressure to assimilate to a thing. And like, you, you almost have to go to a process where you either have to rebel against the system or you just kind of completely succumb and like suppress your own like tendencies. And I mean, I don't want to advertise, oh, you have to set yourself apart because you don't like, you just have to do what you're interested in and, yeah. and realize that, um, yeah, especially like when it comes to professional like work environments and, and also like your own journey, first of all, there's no time limit, like, come on, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah i guess that's fed into by this whole idea that there's this linear path that we have to go to that's just straight ahead and it has this specific slope and if you're not fast enough you can't make it and mm. um it kind of disregards kind of yeah the complexities of life even you know yeah so ruben tell us about it's interesting you touched on the complexity of life you know and, you know, we've had so many conversations about complexity and complex systems and stuff like that. So tell us a little bit about what complexity really is from like your definition. Right. So I guess, I mean, I, first, a little bit of a disclaimer, obviously, like complexity can mean a lot of different things mm. to different people. I'm going to talk a little bit about the scientific meaning of complexity. And I guess the easiest way to kind of contain it first is to kind of say what it's not so we often in in language and semantics especially in the english language we often confuse complicated and complex so the opposite of complicated is simple so we often mm. think like if something's complex it has to be complicated which mm. yeah often is the case like complex things can be complicated uh complicated meaning that there's just a lot of different parts and it may not be very obvious how things work so mm. that's the meaning of complicated. Complexity, on the other hand, uh, means something different. Complex is the opposite of, yeah, it's not necessarily the opposite, but like some people might say the opposite would be a linear or system, meaning that complexity means that it's a nonlinear system. Mm. Um, that means that when it comes to a complex system, we often... The easiest example to explain complexity is with emergent properties. So complex systems obviously often have a layer of properties that happen because of the interrelationships between the different parts. Yep. So, for example, one very easy example to, to grasp the concept with is if you have a puzzle in front of you, that puzzle consists of maybe 100 different parts. Hmm. And... At the end of the day, you can understand the picture of the puzzle, even if a couple of parts are missing. That, sure. is, a, that is not a complex system. Okay. Because at the end of the day, the puzzle is purely the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. A complex system is exactly that. 
it is exactly not that. Not so, that. Okay. So in a complex system, it's not enough to look at the sum of all parts. You can't just take things out of context, essentially. A complex system, in a complex system, the context matters. So if you have um, different actors or different parts of a system, their interrelationships will create new properties between them. Taking, for example, the easiest example that we all know is a family. Hmm. If you have a family of four, you can understand the let's say there's there's the mother the father and two siblings one sister and one brother you can understand the sister in isolation you can do like psychological tests that give her a certain personality and stuff um you can understand the brother in isolation but the relationship between the brother and the sister is something completely new it's an mm. emergent property and that happens a lot in physical systems and biological systems, but also in society as a large. So that's what we mean by complex systems. Mm. And um, there is a little bit of a bias in science right now to neglect no complexity because science, especially Newtonian science, this is mm. a special term uh, named after Isaac Newton, um, is very much about a reductionistic approach to knowledge. So how do we seem to induce or deduct knowledge? Is we take a big problem, for example, how does um, how how does like the railroad work? Okay. And we divide it into smaller little pro problems. For example, okay, how do the rails work? What are they made of? How does the train work? How is the train powered and stuff? And these systems that we kind of, like these little questions we then look at in isolation. And this is a reductionistic approach. Like we tend to try and understand, okay, how does the railroad work? How does the train work? And then we just add them up because we yeah. assume mm. that we can study the little parts of the system in isolation and then just add them up as if they were a sum. Hmm. You know, but as we said, a complex system isn't just a sum of all things. Um, a great complex system that I got to enjoy learning about was the human body. Hmm. You can understand different enzymes within a cell and what they do. However, just adding up the functions of all enzymes doesn't necessarily, or of all molecules in a cell, doesn't necessarily mean that you understand how a cell will function and what the cell will do next. Hmm. Because at the end of the day, it's not just how much stuff is there, but it's also how they interact with each other. Of the course. interrelations between the different molecules in the cell make up new um, patterns and they can actually create an, like these immersion properties that are very important. They create kind of dynamics, so um, effects over time hmm. that we wouldn't normally see if we just study everything in isolation. isolation. So what we essentially have to do in medicine is we have to study how a system reacts to something in mm. order to understand how actually something is done. So you can understand, for example, how a medication is um, what you normally do when you have a clinical trial. Well, you start in the lab, right? You start with a cell line experiment where you treat certain cells with a medication to see what receptors are working and stuff. But that's not enough, right? Because now you've identified the different players in the system. You've identified where it attacks, but you don't understand how it will affect the human as a whole. Hmm. And those complex things need to be studied as well. Wow. And that's where we then go into the field of clinical trials, where we try and understand, okay, how does the system work as a whole? But the issue is we still have we're still using a reductionistic approach because we're still trying to look at it in isolation. But nowadays there's amazing new approaches using data technology that really tries to kind of build complex systems in a native environment. Okay. Where we kind of create simulations of a system or a model that is there to represent a system. It doesn't have to be complete, but these models can already tell us about some very counterintuitive processes that are happening and can avoid us from actually um, kind of having misconceptions about the system just based on the players that we've identified.
So mm. the reductionistic approach in itself is not bad. It's very important to identify the players of a system first. So traditional science has its place. Mm. But now we need to think further and we need to think about if you have if you have a team of players on the field, for example, like give it like I'm gonna use a soccer reference, which is <laughs> okay. <awful> my feel. <laughs> but if you have a field of players, you've mm. identified the different players, you yeah. now need to understand how they play together and yeah. only predict how they're how well the team is going to work, right? Yeah. And that's essentially where the beauty of data technology can come in. Yeah. So that's interesting because if anyone didn't understand anything before with a soccer reference, now they do. Um, <laughs> I mean, which I is good. <laughs> um, but no, I really, uh, the first thing you said, uh, you know, you said we have nonlinear systems and stuff. It's quite interesting because in engineering as well, you know, with any sort of model we have, like I did aeronautical engineering, so our entire thing is nonlinear. Yeah. You know, Navier Stokes equation and all that. And the first thing we always do or at least try to do is linearize an equation because then you can just throw it into a computer. Then all you need to do is matrix algebra and, and you find a solution. Okay. It's not as easy as, it, as I just explained it, but there's a lot more going on, but I, I like what you said, because when you linearize something, you get rid of the higher order terms, yeah. right? But we don't know what information was stored in those higher order terms that might show something very different about, you know, what's happening in, in the process that we just modeled. And another thing was you, you talked about the railway, you talked about, um, you know, studying the train and studying the tracks as separate entities and then just putting them together is very similar to what you talked about the puzzles where you can't just put the puzzles together, but there's a dynamic involved that we still don't understand. That's really, really cool. So how does one even go about starting this? So I know you talked about data, you know, yeah. data-driven approaches now. So what does that look like? So the first thing actually is before you start any data collection or anything, you have to think about the system that you're looking at and whether it is actually nonlinear and mm. whether it actually um, has some inherent complexities. So sometimes mm. you might actually have a case where you can isolate different parts of the system, look at them and add them up. Like that's, those systems still exist. For example, um, the puzzle where it's just different parts putting together, right? Yeah. Um, but sometimes it's more like clockwork where when you take away a certain part of the system, the whole system either doesn't work anymore or it is a completely different thing. So if you have, um, for example, especially when it comes to society and health, you often have these issues where... Um, it's not just biology, it's also your social environment, it's cultural environment, um, and all these different influences kind of govern different parts of, of the system that do influence the kind of thing, and just neglecting it sometimes is taking away, as you say, like you're trying to linearize these higher order terms, but sometimes you're mis lacking uh, very yeah. crucial information, and what happens often in um, public health, that's my area, right? What often happens in public health is we identify risk factors hmm. and we identify um, variables that are very important, for example, in heart disease, where we say, oh, we need to change, um, we need to change the diet of people. But we, the only way we change it is through the one variable that we've identified, which, for example, is, oh, we want to give people more um, healthy advertisement on TV. So we ban advertisement of sugary drinks, which, okay. yeah, that's one step. But we intend the outcome of that step to be marginally way bigger than it's actually going to be because we neglect the dynamics of the system. Wow. So we, we essentially think, oh, by banning advertisement for sugary drinks, this will change the behavior of the population. But if we actually had information on how the complex system works and how social networks influence the behavior of people when it comes to their diet, we would see that, yeah, changing advertisement does a little bit, but it marginally does way less than we intended to. Mm. But if we can couple it with something different, we can maybe reach a thing that's also like very important um, it's a very important concept in complexity science, which is called a critical transition point. Um, 
which is basically where a system shifts from one stable shade to another stable um to another stable kind of um thing so if you for example have the health of the population mm -hmm. you have to see like currently the health of the population is going to stay in in its own trajectory right now but maybe we can push it over the edge and after that edge we have something and this is a very crucial thing in complex systems as well we have feedback loops that yeah. would then transform and and actually push the system to become more healthy so what we could actually do if we would understand the complexity of the population and population health we could set the way so that the system itself becomes more healthy over time so we only have to give it that initial push and then the system does the rest for us rather than us having to do all the hard labor. Mm. So it's a positive stabilize. Exactly. So yeah. there's positive and negative feedback loops. Yeah, yeah. Positive feedback loops tend to aggravate a situation, whilst neg negative feedback loops often tend to stabilize a situation. So negative feedback loops can actually sometimes be a little bit of your downfall even because um, what they mean is that a system is not going to change easily. Mm. You need to put a lot of effort and a lot of like strength into the system mm. in order to push it over that critical transition point mm. and change it. Or you change the like, or you try and block the feedback loops from happening. And this is something that we actually see in public population health a lot is that um, this, the interventions that we come up with often are there to mitigate symptoms. They're there to mitigate the symptoms of a system rather than approach the systemic causes. So the systemic causes for the population getting unhealthy or like having unhealthier things, for example, would be an economy that's purely driven by capitalistic um, impulses yeah. and yeah. Um, where high density, like calorie and high density foods are way cheaper than... Um, healthy foods for example i mean we all know this like yeah. <laughs> whole foods is really expensive while yeah. like getting sugary stuff at tesco is very very easily accessible and the thing is we need to not only do this but we need to couple that initiative with a behavioral impulse because yeah it's great if we give people more opportunity to buy healthy foods but we also need to change their behavior we also need to kind of encourage healthy behaviors so neither one is enough you know mm. and we tend to because we think reductionistically a lot we tend to isolate problems and we tend to attack it in the way where we're like oh yeah okay so we need to change the behavior and we need to make foods more accessible so we work on both but we never really combine them in a way where they're sustainable yeah yeah and that's where complex systems comes in and this is something that i've read and there's an amazing book um called primer on complex systems in population health that goes into a lot of detail first what complexity means meaning like they explain what feedback loops are how emergent properties that i talked about arise between individuals and between different parts of a system and then it goes further into saying okay on a policy perspective how do we first investigate dynamics in a system that are getting more and more important and how do we then, after we investigated it, come up with solutions that combine different approaches in order to create a sustainable solution that actually doesn't, actually. Just, doesn't just mitigate a symptom where we get a little bit of a blip in the system and then it goes back to the stable state because of these negative feedbacks. Hmm. But we actually push the system over this transition point into being more healthy and getting more healthy over time. Yeah, that's crazy. This... You know, when you were speaking, it sort of reminded me of the, the sugar tax I think we have now. Yeah. And it's funny because um, anytime we'd go to, I don't know, Tesco's or whatever, it was a movie night and you wanted to get like a can of Coke or whatever. And what the the, the actual Coca-Cola can is 10 p more than the yeah. Diet Coke. Um, and then that would, even if even though it's 10 p like that would drive people to buy Diet Coke more than, yeah. or Coke Zero more than the actual Coke. But then what we don't realize is there's some other harmful stuff in the other two, which is worse than the sugar. Yeah. Or even like, <laughs> even if that's not the case, the, the question is whether that is not kind of reducing the whole problem 
Mm -hmm. way too simple of a problem you know like it it's almost like the simplicity of that intervention just doesn't match the complexity of the problem (laughs) yeah that's what we often have and that comes from a time funnily in public health where problems were easier you know like Mm -hmm. back in the day most problems that we looked at were um, infectious diseases like COVID-19 and infectious diseases we could understand with linear and simple systems because Before we had microscopes, we didn't see the microbes and viruses that were responsible for these things. So when we came up with microscopy and like we understood, oh, this is actually transmitted through infection rather than just being, I don't know, the wrath of God or something. (laughs) um, We then could treat that infection by locking people down or coming up with a cure for the infection or like Mm. more hygiene that actually was a huge part why population grew and got way more healthy because we implemented hygiene rules um, that got rid of a lot of bacteria and got rid of a lot of viruses but the issue is not all health problems are this simple you know like not all health problems have what we call a proximal cause which Mm. is a cause that's very close to it some health problems like heart disease or cancer even have a lot of different risk factors they have a lot of different parts in the system and there's no way to just predict okay if you drink too much diet coke you're going to have cancer Hmm. but it's the conglomeration of all things that might because of certain predispositions that you have biologically might push you over the edge with a certain probability you know like it's already like you you see it in the way i phrase it it's already so hard to tell. Even phrase it up, yeah. Exactly. And 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 it's already so hard to predict that if we were to understand these transition points, when someone mm. is more likely to get cancer, mm. we could implement initiatives that, that could pr- like kind of act as a prophylaxis to kind of stop people from reaching that critical transition point. You know, like it's all about identifying, okay, where in this dynamical system do you actually currently position yourself? Like, where are you right now? Like, where is your health right now? And like, often that's completely out of our control. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of amazing research on the effects of pollution on on the human body. And um, there's a lot of interesting studies that go at it very reductionistically that say okay pollution is doing this to our bodies that to our bodies that's very important but we also need to identify okay where is where can pollution maybe push our already pre-existing health conditions over the edge Mm. and then create what we see now where in urban centers people are way more susceptible to um cancer to to heart disease to to all of these different things but that's not just because of pollution but pollution plays a factor in it but we need to understand the system as a whole in order to identify where these like critical points are in the system Mm -hmm. and it's interesting because if you map them out and if you map out the feedback loops between the different parts often you can see oh wait a minute there's one player that seems to be very important because there's 50 feedback loops that go back into it or that that go from it and other things seem less connected so that's um the concept of connectivity where you kind of identify okay if you have three attack points that could promote health which one do you prioritize you know so if you like let's go back to our sugar tax thing like Mm. if you were to implement um either a higher sugar tax or make healthy foods more available or create more advertisement for healthy foods um, in on TV, which one would you prioritize? It gets incredibly difficult, right? Because there's there's good reasons to do all three. All three, yeah. But at some point, it is also a, a matter of money, sadly. Like, that, mm. that's, like yeah, unfortunately. that's also a case. You know, like, you have to look at cost-benefit effectiveness things. And this is where complex systems can also help because by identifying the connectivity of different issues, you can identify, okay, which player might be more important and actually be the root cause. And this again comes back to not trying to mitigate the symptoms purely. Mitigating the symptoms is always important. I don't want to say that that's not important at all, but we need to stop just mitigating the symptoms. We need to understand 
the root causes of things and how do we change the root causes and the root causes often come down to very difficult to change things um like for example our economic system and mm -hmm. stuff in our economic system but this is where we need to empower um policy makers to really come up with creative solutions that could really tackle certain parts of the system that then give us this trajectory that we're going into a healthier system or something yeah it's just funny because the amount of times you and i have both said let's stop looking at just the symptoms and start looking at the root causes of the past three years is insane yeah. i mean but... we see it a lot in different movements right now right like yeah. the social justice movement and black lives matter and stuff it's <clears> all about <throat> understanding the systemic oppression of people and the systemic causes like um and i think one of the most powerful things i've heard was like if you were to replace all people in the system but mm. the structures the system mm. would still um re-establish itself meaning yeah. that even if you got rid of all people on earth and got completely new people if you have the same institutions these institutions will re-establish the current system because what these institutions actually mean, and this is what, 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 where complex systems comes in, these institutions are feedback loops. Yeah. So if you change all the players in the systems, but you keep the nodes, you keep the different feedback loops, so you're not really changing the players, you're just changing mm -hmm. the people, but the system in itself is the same picture, then all all it is, you're giving people different names. A diff maybe, maybe it will change it marginally, but over time and this is where proximity goes in maybe in the short run it might change something but in mm. the long run again you're mitigating the symptom in the long run it will go back to the stable state because of all those feedback loops mm. but what you have to do is you have to of course still mitigate the symptoms you still need short-term change but you also need long-term change and long-term change is often facilitated by system change and what i mean by that is we need to reconfigure the feedback loops in a system or find ways to reconfigure the system as a whole yeah yeah wow so ruben tell us a little bit about what even got you into all of this because this is incredibly cool stuff and I'm going to flex a little bit. I like the fact that I understand bit, bits of it. Um, I think it's very hard to understand. I'm, I, I think there will be a lot of listeners right now that will be very confused. Hmm. And I think that's because it's very hard. Like our brain just, just normally, and this is the reason why also reductionistic approaches are favored. Our brain, the way our brain is structured and, and works in heuristics, which are these mental shortcuts, how we um kind of how we um digest information how we analyze information in the day-to-day -day is it's counterintuitive for us to think in complex terms yeah because if you're in a survival environment um you tend to like you tend to go for the best solution possible but the one that takes the least amount of time and the least effort um, which means that like if and and this is a typical like it's a human bias everyone holds this well everyone new like neurotypical yeah holds this um mm. bias and and it often results in that that when we talk about complexity it's very hard to understand um full stop i'm gonna now actually answer your question <laughs> go on, go on. What got me into this is um I learned about complexity the first time during uni um, in a course called Integrative Systems Biology. There you already have it. There's systems in it where we looked at complex systems in biology and how my professor always used to say it. Um, the typical approach of a biologist is to kind of take apart um, the car and analyze all the different single parts and then try and like configure the car. The issue is, imagine you had all the different parts of a car and a motor and everything laid in front of you, but you've never actually seen a car in your life. Hmm. Try and then figure out how all of these tiny li little parts, I think he literally showed us a picture of like a car completely disassembled. It was like 300 different like mechanical parts. The red one. 
exactly it's the like, red one yeah exactly like 300 different mechanical parts and like try and configure a thing out of it that works mm. um but you've never seen a car before so you don't under, you don't know what it's supposed to do even you don't even know that it's supposed to transport people yeah um so this is kind of the issue that reductionistic science sometimes even has besides completely neglecting emergent properties it's kind of very hard to sometimes understand what a system is supposed to do by just looking at its parts yeah. so um what complex systems is trying to do is look at it from a holistic perspective and often it needs to come after a point where the different players in the system have already been identified so the traditional science does sometimes have to come first and yeah of course complex system builds on that knowledge and i think that's where um kind of my interest got in because complex systems has a lot of potential to to have some real life impact you know like i was i was kind of struggling because i was like in this class and for the first time i realized oh my god this is amazing because now like my issue with with biochemistry at the part was a lot of biochemical research is very specific and only deals with very minuscule, like very tiny parts of a problem. And I felt like I, I wanted to be involved with something that, that really ha had an impact, a lasting impact within my lifetime, yeah. within, within research. And I, I felt like this, this, this burden almost that, that if I work in something for 15, 20 years, and I maybe <laughs> contribute to a development that could maybe help people's lives in 50 years that felt very um yeah it felt very unsatisfying to me but it also like felt a little bit like i was doing the sisyphus task which is very important and there's a lot of people that do it but you you have to be the right person to do that you know like you have to have an innate interest in kind of pushing forward academic knowledge and what i wanted to do is i wanted to essentially gather the academic knowledge that was there and figure out, okay, what does that actually mean for us? Yeah, How yeah. can we take all of the knowledge out there and can actually deduce something from it that really could then tell us, oh, how do we have to deal with certain diseases? Or how can we approach kind of new interventions? Or where do we think new research might actually lead to a cure for something? Hmm. And this is where Complex System was great because it essentially showed me like, oh, you can actually look at the system as at large whilst combining all of these like different things together. And that was very rewarding to me. And, and, and so that's where I got my first impulses for complexity. And then mm. I soon realized that these ideas of complex systems are now quite established within the natural sciences but they have a lot of value beyond them because mm -hmm. we tend to often funnily again, a product of like kind of realistic <laughs> thinking, we tend to often divide into different disciplines. Right. But there's so much need for interdisciplinary studies right now where we take the knowledge from biology, but we combine it with knowledge of social systems and we kind of create these integrative systems funnily again, that kind of can tell, okay, how does a patient react not only biologically, but also through its social impressions and stuff to a certain me medicine? Because what we sometimes see is that certain patients react very poorly to certain medicines and certain re uh, patients might react very positively. Positive. Yeah. And, and often that is not purely explainable by biology as alone because it's sometimes it's also explained by um access to information which comes a lot through social systems so i'm not making anything up or something it's not just like social systems cannot just be support but like what have, has been seen is if a cancer patient has a lot of information meaning that it has a very strong um, social system of different other patients that go through similar things they can kind of talk to each other and learn from each other yeah. and this connective learning actually helps patients um, mitigate their disease better on their own day to day. Because what we forget, it's not just the pill that you take, it's not just chemotherapy that you do, but it's like, 
changing your whole diet it's it's mm. living a certain lifestyle whilst you're mm. dealing with that cancer and like learning from other patients is very important and being privy to that information has helped a lot of patients so this is actually one of the best research that i've read on complex systems and cancer was trying to combine biological systems and social systems and it was and it's really groundbreaking to see that sometimes these differences that we see in patient disease progression can be explained by social systems and not just biological systems. Mm. Which means, again, coming back to what you said earlier with the linearization of, of problems, um, we would completely disregard in a, in a study if it was purely made, like if we would purely look at the biological things, we wouldn't see yeah. the differences in social system. So we wouldn't understand why certain people would react yeah. this way or the other way. So isn't this very similar to what you did for your bachelor's thesis, which I am going to say the word now? Go ahead. Under, under representation of women in clinical trials. Yeah. So yeah. that was, I guess it's it's all a continuous line. Um, mm. So I did my bachelor's thesis on the underrepresentation of women in clinical trials. Yes. Um, <laughs> Which is a time breaker. Um, and I've essentially identified first that there's not really a working definition that actually um, that really explains why representation in a medical sense is important. Hmm. So there's a lot of different approaches and there are a lot of different hypotheses. Some people say you need to, in order to increase the external validity of a study, you need to go by the disease prevalence, meaning that if you have, for example, if you're studying something with heart disease, you should include as many women and as many men percentually, like in talking in percent, um, as are affected by the disease in the population, because that makes your study more representative of the population as a whole, which, yes, that's a very important point. But when it comes down to it, representation means that you include as many individuals as necessary, as little as needed. So it's kind of this this dichotomy, like you need to include as many as necessary, but you don't need to include more than necessary either. Okay, so there's like so a you need to find a point. A, yeah, and and now comes the important caveat: as many as necessary to induce, like to create knowledge or to to understand something about a disease or a medication. Um, so that none of the people that you included or none of the people that you claim the knowledge is for are disadvantaged by the knowledge, meaning that you don't claim to have understood something about a population at large if you haven't looked at a certain group. Hmm. And that's what happens a lot with women. So historically, women have been excluded from a lot of research, which means that we have a lot of information that is predominantly um, focused on how the disease looks in males. And we, to this day, therefore, have lower rates of diagnosing women with, for example, um, coronary heart disease and stuff, because we look for specific symptoms that are very male specific. Right. And um, it's actually funny because when I came up with this whole um, new like kind of explanation where I said, okay, representation has, um, it has an aim, you know, I realized that in a biological term, what you need to look at is biological variables and not social variables. And this is where like men and women, these categories only help hold so much value because at the end of the day, if you know your medication is going to interact with, for example, sex hormones, um, woman before her menopause is completely different in her hormone profile than a woman after her menopause. So mm. putting both of them in the same category and just bunching them in isn't very scientific because you're not actually looking at the variable that is important here, which is hormones. You're looking at a social variable that's just a placeholder for that variable. Mm. And that actually, when you apply that, you actually realize the biological variables are way more inclusive because it doesn't matter if it's a trans woman or a man or a, a non-binary person um, or a woman. It really just matters whether they have a certain hormone profile and what that hormone profile does 
in response to the medication. Because then you can say, okay, we see that testosterone influences how much of that medication you need to take, for mm. example. And then if you prescribe that medication to a patient, you need to say, okay, based on your testosterone level, you need to take that much of that medication. No need to include gender, no need to include a social placeholder. Um, and I think this is where where a lot of like the mishaps happen because in essentially what I've then through my analysis kind of deduced is that women are often now included in, in studies a lot, mm. actually. Like mm. women are quite representatively included thanks to um, policy development of the early 2000s. Um, the European Union now has... Um, guidelines and, and laws that say that women have to be included in medical research if that medical research claims to to investigate the whole population it has to test the whole population which mm. is very scientific mm. if like sometimes there might be like i'm not saying that there might not be an interest in just studying women or just studying men but then the kind of conclusions that you draw can only be about women or men yeah, You know, like you can't conclude something about a group that you haven't studied. And that's what's happened historically a lot. And what I've seen is that whilst women are included a lot now, um, these sex-specific differences are not discussed a lot. So it's already, it's great. So we now know that a medication, for example, works for the population at large. But when it comes to side effects, we don't kind of look at the different subgroups, which mm. again then means that if you have a medication and 5% of people would have some side effects, you might be inclined to say, okay, um, I will approve this medication and people will take it because 5% is not that much. However, if you realize through <laughs> analysis of the subgroups that these 5% are all women between the age of 30 and 35, that means that you need to kind of then reevaluate whether you want to give that medicine to it's women different. whether between the age of 30 and 35 because there clearly has been something within that subgroup that has happened and it's kind of this still like the, the term for it is androcentrism like the idea that that our knowledge still because of historical systems and because of the historical system that we had in science is still very focused still like we we pretend that it's a now gender neutral but because of the feedback from back and this is where we go back into complex systems because of kind of the structure and the system that has established all the prior knowledge all the knowledge that we now gather is informed by that prior knowledge meaning that we need to either deconstruct that prior knowledge and kind of identify where that prior knowledge is not serving women or is not including women properly, or we need to, well, we need to do that. That's, that's full stop. The thing that we need to do. <laughs> and, and I think this is, this is uh, what, what you probably meant with, this is a continuation of, of my work, like where I realized that complex systems can like really do matter in, in any yeah. sort of field, because this is essentially academic research now. And what we see is that the historic system of, academic research, which is very centered on Western academic research of white men, um, that <laughs> does not serve to a certain extent um, other communities and other populations. We doesn't we don't just see that in women, but we also see that a lot with um, different ethnicities because different ethnicities tend to have a different gene pool and different genetic predispositions. So sometimes um, we have a very strong idea of a disease in a certain population, but it shows different in in brown or black people. And because it shows different in brown or black people, we tend to underdiagnose these people, which mm. means a lot of people get medical care way later than their white counterparts because we're just biased towards white bodies. And um, I think we need to actively work to kind of reestablish that. And this is where um, Bayesian statistics actually is really important to remember, is that all research that we're doing is just reevaluating and reinforming our prior information. So all the research that we're doing is essentially just taking our prior information and building on top of that. Hmm. 
which means that we need to be aware of the biases of our prior information. And the biases of our prior information are often rooted in systemic racism and in systemic issues at, at large that we're trying to fight all over the world right now in justice systems. But we also need to look at it in academic systems and in complex systems. And um, sometimes it's not even about oppression of people or, or disadvantage of people. Sometimes it's about disadvantage of constructs as a whole. For example, we tend to prioritize reductionistic approaches. Mm -hmm. And that's, for example, disadvantaging complexity science. And it's disadvantaging looking at the complexity of systems and dynamics, which means that for the longest time, we have prioritized identifying the players in the system, the players on the football field, rather than trying to understand how the players work together in order to score a goal. You know, so what Amazing. we need to do now is we need to still identify the players, but we also need to build on, on top of that. And mm -hmm. we need to kind of like we need to kind of identify where maybe identifying the players has also disadvantaged the other systems like no that's incredible it indeed is very complex and in this case also very complicated but i think it's so cool and if we you know if people want to people listening to this yeah. found everything very very confusing that's completely fine i'm a bit lost myself not gonna lie but Mostly in general, I think in a holistic perspective, it, it, it makes a lot of sense why we should continue going in this direction, definitely. So I have two more questions, Ruben, before we leave. If people want to find out more about complex systems and just understand it a little bit, you know, even at a fundamental level, what can they do? So there's some really good resources, finally, on YouTube. Mm. Um, if you just type in complex systems, there's some, some really good kind of fundamental videos um and there's a lot of them actually like most of them are like this is this field has kind of originated from physics so there's a lot of like just playing <clears throat> on statistics and physics but it's kind of just a it's just the process of thought that once you're into it you can apply it to any kind of different Anything. field and if you are interested in a very specific field i would encourage you to just look up um, complex systems or integrative systems or complexity science and then your specific field. That's how I found my book on complex systems and population health, mm. which gave amazing examples on how it could help with population health as well. Amazing. Wow. And, um, you know, people like you and me, Ruben, we're very oriented towards trying to make a very purposeful and impactful change in the world. You know, can you tell us a little bit about how you're planning on, if, if you've already thought about this, but how you're planning on using all of this to, you know, create this wonderful, positive impact in the world? I mean, you've given so many examples already, but I was just thinking yeah. if there's anything specific you have in mind. So personally, what I would love to do is I would love to investigate, um, health disparities along the social gradient, meaning that I would like to see how socioeconomic position um, has an impact on health. Hmm. And I want to use complex systems approaches to identify it because I think, as said, in population health, we talk a lot about risk factors and socioeconomic position, that's how we call that variable, um, is often called a risk factor for certain diseases and stuff. But that's not necessarily indicative of the problem at large, because what we've seen over history is that the diseases have changed, but people with lower economic standing and social economic standing have always been disadvantaged hmm. within health. So they've hmm. always had it harder health wise, and they, they seem to be more sensitive to diseases in this, in a, like over time the only thing that has changed is the disease that we're talking about. So the diseases come and go, but the disadvantage is always there. And mm. if you think about it, a disadvantage in health always means um, a disadvantage in life. Of course. You know, like, and this is where the concept of health equity comes in, where we, like, I truly believe everyone should have a right to a healthy life. And everyone does have that right. And um, at the end of the day, we need to provide people with health 
in a way that if someone needs more help, they're supposed to get more help in order to achieve the same standard of living as other people. And this is where equity comes in. It's not equality, it's equity. So equality is when you give everyone the same opportunities and equity goes a step for, further in the saying, okay, we need to ident- like we need to um, be aware that some people have been disadvantaged by the system or are disadvantaged by the system. So therefore they deserve more help or the system needs to change in order not to disadvantage them anymore. Mm. You know? So that's what I would love to do. And concretely, I would love to work closely with different governments um, on the European level and kind of help them identify different policies, but also um, community interventions. I really like the approach of like doing something in the local level that could actually have an impact and kind of combine the both and see whether that's going to be sustainable. And like computer and data approaches are really cool for that because you can kind of it's kind of very hard to know how a policy intervention will affect the people because you you can always like predict, but you can never really tell. But with data analytics, we can nowadays build models that can simulate hmm. how, like with a certain probability, how something will turn out. And we can simulate a lot of different scenarios. So we can p- potentially say, okay, if you take this policy together with this community intervention, you could actually push the system into a healthier state, you know? And that's what I would like to do. I would essentially try and create the evidence to say, out of the 15 things that you're currently thinking of doing, these three need to be done. Mm. And then we, like, the, the very little money that's available would actually have an impact. So it's all about making sure that the the little funds that are available in public health actually have the impact desired and that we make sure that 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 is spread out and that is like that really helps people ruben i don't think i say this enough but thank you so much for being such an inspiring person well i mean to be honest without you i don't think i would have had this path you know Man, the past four years have been such a roller coaster for the both of us. Yeah. And, uh, for anyone listening in, <laughs> it's been, especially like during the lockdown season, we, I remember he was doing his bachelor's thesis and I was doing my group design project. And then the, it sort of flipped in the fourth year because I was applying to jobs and was doing my final year project and he was in the management course. It was crazy because um, you're right, like, you know, we even talked about like diversity initially. And I remember, you know, you coming from a biochemistry and management perspective, and I was coming more from a coding perspective, yeah. but you were able to solve problems I was having. And I was able to solve problems you were having in your thing with a completely different perspective. And I just think it shows how powerful something can be um, being different. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh and and yeah. we said this a million times, I think, where we were like, <laughs> if we had these groups at Imperial, yeah, where we would yeah, just yeah. have had friends from different backgrounds kind of helping each other with their problems. Yeah. Man, like, stuff that we could have achieved, you know? Like, I feel like I learned so much through living with you and, like, yeah. talking to you. And I think a lot of people don't have access to that. It's true. It's very true. And I think it's so important to create consciously try and create that for people as well you know i mean for people like you and me in positions of you know either well i was president last year for this spiritual society and you are you know trying to create this um community at imperial i think for people like us who are in in a relatively position of power yeah you know i don't want to i don't like using that statement but with that power comes with a lot of uh, with that power comes a lot of responsibility you know quoting spider-man and uncle ben there (laughs) but i think people like you and me really have the power to create that change for people. And, you know, this, this is, this is a line you've told me many times quoting from Robert Downey Jr., you know, creating that safe place for, yeah. for people to sort of grow into. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And thank you for this very, very intellectual, uh, intellectually stimulating I'm conversation. Sorry, it was mostly a monologue, but no, no, please, please. I think people are going to find this so interesting because I don't think people have this kind of conversation a lot, yeah. you know, and it's a level of 
it's a deeper science. It's almost like, I don't know, it's like a next level. Yeah. science you know because you're looking at a much bigger picture than, than isolating something yeah and i mean i'm just tapping into it you know like yeah. I've, I've started to get in contact with looking at complexity and complex systems which is just a part of science really and mm. another approach to science um only like two years ago and i just had a pretty much a massive break to it when I did the management course because that was completely different. It was more <laughs> about practical skills and learning how to market an idea and stuff, which to be fair is probably closer to um yeah, real life than other things maybe, but, um, but yeah. We learn a lot from all I'm, of it. I'm just at the start of my journey and I can't wait to to learn how to to communicate these things even better and like learn how to even like understand these things better because i think it's it's in general like a thing where it's like because it's so counterintuitive to the, to the human psyche it takes a lot of mental effort in order to wrap your head completely around these constructs no definitely definitely and we gotta i can't wait to have you back on season two season three and you know how many ever seasons there will be because <laughs> it's always going to be interesting to hear more about you know yeah hopefully i will be able to provide my own case studies at some point so i'll just no, absolutely so i'll just give you some references from my own work because understanding the the fundamentals and the theory is one thing but being able to apply it is a completely different one and I can't wait what this year and the years to come will bring me and like. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Ruben. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. We really hope you learned something new. Before we end, let's take another moment to reflect on the word complexity. After this, think about what changed between your feelings before and after the episode. This podcast was created so we can listen to all our stories and learn from each other because there's so much that we all experience in our individual journeys. Being able to have even a small glimpse of someone's journey can add so much perspective to our lives, help us grow together and be able to better understand ourselves and each other. Despite all our differences, there's so much more that we have in common. This is a listener supported podcast, so any level of Patreon subscription or one-time donation will be accepted with a lot of gratitude and used back to making this podcast experience even greater. The different subscriptions can be found on my Patreon page, which will be linked in the description. This was recorded during COVID times with little to no professional equipment, so the quality may sometimes vary. We apologize for this inconvenience, but despite that, we hope you were able to connect with the message of this episode. Once again, thank you so much for tuning in, and we hope to see you next week. Take care.